Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, and thanks for your patience, too. Longtime viewers ask about the fate of this pallet wood door build video from time to time, and that makes me wish I was a better video producer. My only response is that I think it's a sure bet that I'm a better door builder than your average Spielberg, and I can only hope that you like this door enough to agree. Episode number seven of the series shows how I built this tenon panel door, and then episode eight shows how to make this custom cove casing that you see here, even though I didn't cover actually installing the casing in that video. As it stands now, I'm almost done producing a video that shows how to make 44 slats like this that I'll use to fill in the faces of this pallet wood door before I realized that I need to show my YouTube audience how I did the final prep and varnishing of the door itself first. Patreon members have seen a number of patron-only behind-the-scenes videos that show work done to this door since episode number seven that fill in some of the blanks and bring me to this point where the door is ready for final prep and get the gel poly finish that you see here. And those are all reasons why I'm excited to be at this pivotal point in the build series on the home stretch to finishing up this door. That's also why I'm ready to get to work. And if you are, let's do this. A fair amount of fussing and fitting goes into hanging any door, even if it's manufactured and pre-hung. So you can imagine that the amount of effort and complication that goes into hanging a custom-made door is that much more difficult. And on a door that's custom-made, custom-designed, and custom-built out of pellet wood, the whole process is exponentially more involved. So I'm very thankful to be at this stage where all I have to do is put some varnish on this thing to finish it up. Some of you saw me install Sugitsune concealed hinges in this door in a previous episode, and the lock set itself is pretty standard carpentry, drill a couple holes and screw it in, so I didn't cover that. And that leaves me with one thing remaining to do to this door before I varnish it, and that is to put a uh, door bottom on to seal up the gap between there to keep dust and noise on this side of the door from migrating through to the other side of the door. And I can only do that when the door's off, so that's the first thing I'm going to do with this. Because I'm showing off the beauty of this pallet wood, and I've got a wooden threshold, I don't want any part of that door bottom to show when the door is closed. And because I designed this with a half inch gap under there, I couldn't use a standard door seal for this. So I had to customize one to meet those parameters, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But for now, I need to pull this hardware and grunt this slab onto the table so I can work on it. In a final bit of irony, I'll be using the cardboard from the old cardboard door to protect the door when I put it on my work surface. And I think it's a fitting final chapter for the cardboard door that's served for so well and so long. One thing I can tell you for sure about this door is that in all the months I've been working on it, it has not become lighter in the least. This thing is a beast, and I'm not even done with it yet. And it'll be heavier still when it's finally complete. Well, there is certainly nothing light about that puppy, but having it on the bench or the work surface like this is what makes it possible to install this uh, door bottom on it. And um, here's the video sequence, out of breath, here's the video sequence I shot that shows how I modified a stock MD door bottom into this configuration that's necessary to seal up the gap on the bottom of the door and at the same time prevent the hardware from showing. I was planning to use a door bottom like this with the two bulbs and the three fins, only with the barbs on top that fit into slots on the bottom of the door. And I left a half inch of space between the bottom of the door and the threshold, only to learn later that this type of door bottom only seals up three eighths of an inch. So I had a little bit of a predicament. So I did some shopping around and came up with this door bottom by MD because its spec shows that it's a half inch tall and should do a fair job of sealing up the gap at the bottom of the door. Only trouble is I don't like this profile because I don't want any metal showing on the face of the door. But I do like the look and fit of the seal part placed in the track. So I'm gonna do a little bit of modification to get the best of both worlds. This kind of modification is a little bit dicey, but it's easy enough. The modification I want to make involves cutting off this front part of the door bottom by separating it right here. Simple enough. 
That way I'll have a nice extruded aluminum channel for the weather strip to fit in that can be attached securely to the bottom of the door with a few screws. I've got a nice sharp 24 tooth carbide tipped thin kerf blade in the table saw. And I set the blade height so that the teeth are a bit higher than the channel for making a clean cut. But I don't want those any higher than necessary for cutting this aluminum. Next, I'll set the rip fence to accurately slice off the channel from the drip lip to get the door bottom piece that I'm after. I don't have much room to work with between the channel and this vertical flange, but with a thin kerf blade, it's entirely possible. And I'll make a quick test cut to check my setting. And now, with the appropriate professional push stick in my hand, earplugs in my ears, and a face shield covering my face, it just takes a few seconds to quickly and accurately create the little door bottom piece that I'm after in the first place. Just like that. And if anybody needs a drip lip for a door bottom, I got one for sale at a price you can't beat. Back at the bench, a few licks with a file and a sharp putty knife clean up that cut edge so that it's really difficult to tell which edge was cut and which edge came from the factory. And now that channel is going to work great on the bottom of this door. Because there's not ribs to fit in slots on the bottom of the door, I just slide out the weather strip part, mark out a few holes, and then use my trusty Whitney punch to punch five screw holes along the bottom of this channel. And I prefer the nice clean punched holes I get using this method compared to the ragged edges that are left behind with a drill bit. And for those of you who've not used a Whitney punch before, I'll explain that all I need to do is look through the hole in the bottom of the punch to see the sharpie marks I made along the center of this channel to line it up and punch the holes accurately. And when I'm done, screws fit in perfectly. And with that modification done, initial installation of this door bottom is a pretty simple procedure. And I'm just going to use some heavy masking tape to tape it in place. And that masking tape is a very quick, easy, simple, and effective way of centering up the hardware between the faces of the door and between the edges of the door to hold it in position. And then use a Vix bit for piloting the screw holes and a little bit of wax on the screws to drive them in to this solid ash door bottom. This little wax lube stick is perfect for putting just a dab of wax on the screws so they drive easily into this ash hardwood. So I keep one of those sticks on hand at all times in the shop for just this sort of thing. And now I slip the vinyl weather stripping piece into the channel across the door just to confirm the final fit of the hardware. That'll be excellent. And it'll do a nice job of sealing the gap between the bottom of the door and the top of the threshold. In the final installation, I'll use a sharp scratch awl and a hammer to dimple the channel to pinch this vinyl weather stripping in place so it doesn't slide out of the channel when the door is in consistent use. But for now, I slip the weather strip back out under the screws and mark the channel for position when I go to reinstall it after the door has been varnished. Just in case the screw holes aren't quite centered up relative to the ends of the channel. With the patient on the operating table, I'll use the same sanding sequence that I always do to prepare wood for a gel poly finish. I start out with an oops eraser to erase any layout marks. This stuff was for the hardware. Uh, then I give everything a once over with 150 grit sandpaper on this sanding block. I follow that with 220 grit on this gator sanding block, this hook and loop pad. It's a nice cushioned surface, gives a smooth finish. And then the last step is to use a sheet of carefully folded 320 grit sandpaper. And to get maximum use out of a piece of trifold sandpaper, I number the surfaces like that. So I use them in sequence. And each surface of the sandpaper gets used completely, and I don't waste time guessing which surface has the most sanding capability remaining. And that final pass with this 320 grit sandpaper leaves the buttery smooth surface on that wood that I always want prior to applying gel varnish. Because I've done my homework on all these pieces, they were carefully planed in the thickness planer, so they're smooth to start off with. I had to do a little bit of belt sanding, etc. after glue up. But the majority of the sanding work is far behind me. So at this stage of the game, this is just kind of an overall touch up and refinement at the end of a sequential sanding process. And I should mention the lettering you see here. This is a template in the font that I'll use for the letters on the door. But I've yet to determine the type and source for those letters. But this sticker just gives me insight into proportions, etc for when I actually do choose the lettering 
and order it. One more step that I do before final sanding of the door is to install these special little pivoting brackets, one to the top and one to the bottom of the door. Naturally, I need to remove the beefy sugetsune hinges from the edge of the door before finishing. I take a second to label them B and T for bottom and top so that the minor adjustments that the hinges need to make the door hang and swing properly are preserved. Once all the mundane hardware steps are handled, the cleanup and sanding process really goes quick. I just make sure that I do each step thoroughly. I erase all the pencil marks, I sand everything with 150, I sand everything with 220, sand everything with 320 in a systematic approach so that I don't have to keep going back to catch little spots that I missed the first time through. So that systematic approach really pays off. I'm betting that a lot of viewers are rather surprised at how many steps are involved in doing a project like this. I kind of blame that on the HGTV mentality where they wouldn't spend 45 seconds showing finishing a door. Somebody would come in with a roller, slap on some varnish and walk away. That's the end of it. But to do this kind of work at this level, there's an incredible amount of steps involved and that's if you do it efficiently in the first place. I expect and get excellent results, but unless somebody sees all the backstory and all these steps, it's not necessarily common knowledge what all is involved in producing these kind of results. But with all those sanding steps completed on this side of the door, I'll get it flipped and go through all those same steps on the other side to make sure that the door is 100% prepared and ready for the gel poly. I shut off the shop lights and use the glancing light from a flashlight to show that the only thing that remains on the surface of the wood is the texture of the wood itself. There's no sanding scratches, there's no planer snipe, there's no cross grain sanding scratches where the style meets the rails, etc. Everything is all sanded smooth to 320 grit scratch, which isn't visible to the naked eye. There's nothing left behind but the natural texture and character of the pallet wood. And I'm absolutely certain that if I don't address this chip in the bottom corner of the door, there's going to be an endless string of comments going on and on about that chip. So I'll take the time to show you the steps, how something like this gets fixed. This chip happened when I was fitting the door before I eased the edge on this, caught on the concrete and flicked that little bit of grain off of there. And everyone knows you don't start a project over from scratch because of something like this. You fix it up, it goes away, and it's all good. Because in the end, you're only as good as the mistakes you can fix, right? To start off, I found a piece of scrap that had a similar color to the edge of the door and then used the chisel to snap off a little splintery piece. The only piece that fits perfectly here is the piece that came off and I don't have that. But this is definitely a reasonable facsimile. Next, I take Starbond Accelerator and spray the affected area. I'll use Starbond's thick CA glue and apply a very heavy coat to the splintery end of this little scrap and then stick it in place and hold it till the accelerator cures the CA. This is a good time to exercise hygiene because it's just as easy to stick your finger to the door as it is to stick a wood scrap to the door. That was a pretty thick layer of CA, so I'm giving this extra time to make sure it's cured well and another dose of accelerator just to clear up anything that didn't get activated outside the margins of the repair. That piece is attached very firmly there after just a few seconds. And next I'll take this little Irwin pull saw and cut off the excess repair splinter material. I'd like to use a block plane on this, but because everything is so thin, slivery, and splintery, I'll resort to sandpaper. And the sandpaper I'll use is attached to my best blocks for demanding sanding, starting out with a sharp 80 grit belt on this block. And that does a very quick job of removing excess material, but there's still a little roughness in the texture of the wood. So I give it another shot of CA and a few more dabs of CA glue, but I use medium this time instead of the thick. And a little shot of accelerator after that CA is applied helps it to cure from underneath and on top simultaneously. In a few seconds that CA is cured, I go back at it with the 80 grit paper, making sure to put a good bevel on that corner of the door so this doesn't happen again. The 80 grit belt does the shaping and stock removal, and I follow it with 120 grit to smooth up the surface and remove the 80 grit scratch. And with those initial steps complete, I follow up with the 150, 220, and 320 grit sandpaper to finish this repair. Once the final sanding is done, a light spritz of alcohol shows you what the end result will look like when it gets gel poly. Remarkably close to perfect for how bad that looked just three minutes ago, don't you think? Once that thorough sanding process is done, both sides, all edges, all faces, it's time to put this uh, 
on stands so that I can varnish both faces at the same time. And that's when I convert my roller stands into rotisserie stands. Longtime viewers uh, who've been patient about the pallet door build have been even more patient about the roller stand build. And uh, so I'll let you know that my plan is that once this pallet door is swinging and done, I'm going to do that roller stand build. That's the goal. And I've got this threaded bracket screwed back on to the top and the bottom of the door. So all I need to do is raise this adjustment up and screw this half inch bolt into this half inch all thread connector. And then put a little up pressure on the pipe and lock it in place. Naturally I repeat the same steps at the top of the door. And once the door is suspended above the tabletop, I use a vice grip and a clamp to hold it horizontal. And then I can wheel the table saw work table out from underneath the door, which gives me complete access to both faces of the door so I can varnish and flip it at will. And I'll stop my little circus sideshow with the door in the horizontal position and the shop face of the door facing up so I can start the varnish. As everyone who's done even a bit of woodwork knows, applying the first few wipes of a finish on a project is always a major highlight. After spending hours, days, months, weeks, sometimes years, getting a project to the stage where it's actually ready for the finish, there's just an overwhelming sense of fulfillment and accomplishment when it gets to this stage. The actual process of applying gel poly is pretty routine and mundane. So I'm not going to go through a lot of it here, but I do want to show the initial area and I'm going to focus on this part. Anybody that's watched this pallet wood door video from early on will remember that one particular piece of pallet wood had a piece of copper wire running through it and I went to great lengths to preserve that piece on this corner of the door. I'll zoom way in so you can see in the glint of the light the end of that stranded copper wire that was hung over a branch of an ash tree who knows where and for how long and ended up making its way into the next level carpentry pallet wood door for the shop. In days gone by it would be just an absolute travesty to leave this kind of defects in the face of a finished piece of millwork but in these days of natural grain, live edge, wood, etc. this is just a perfect touch for a project like this. Gel poly comes in kind of a a thick goopy state and applying it couldn't be easier. I just take a paper towel. You can use rags, but I've got a paper towel here. Dab on a big glob and presto. Instant magnificence. I'm just slathering on a very heavy coat. I'll get into the edges of the door as well and I just put as much on as the wood will absorb. I'll work the whole show face and edge of the shop side latch style on this door at the same time, applying as much of the gel poly as the surface will absorb. You gotta just love watching that grain come alive as I swab on this first heavy coat of gel poly. And I'll zoom in on this bottom corner of the strike jam here to show you what that repair I made just a few minutes ago looks like after getting sanded and coated with gel poly. And after all the many months and many steps to get to this stage, if it wasn't for the transformation of dull muted grain into active highlighted grain, this step in the process would be, frankly, anticlimactic. After a good 10 minutes of wiping and soaking and reapplying, the gel poly starts to stiffen up a little bit. So I switch from a saturated paper towel, being careful to open it up and let fold it out. I don't want to leave that sitting wadded up because it can and will catch on fire. But I switch to a clean dry paper towel and do an initial wipe down of all the areas. And you can quickly feel uh, when you're doing this just how buttery smooth that surface is. It's a little sticky at first because of the layer of gel poly that's on and in the wood. But it doesn't take long at all to clean up the excess and get start getting that wonderful smooth sheen that's characteristic of gel poly on well prepared wood. And after all the globs that I put on there you can see not very much is coming off in this paper towel so there's a surprising amount of that 
heavy, thick varnish that gets down into the pores of the wood and seals it up and gives it a durable luster. So I do that initial wipe down. Uh, then I take compressed air and blow out any nooks and crannies, corners here, um, character in the wood, screw holes for the hardware, etc. I just blow it into that cloth or paper towel. Being careful not to trip on my roller stand. Compressed air works comp uh, particularly well on little sharp edges like this uh, latch bolt prep here. And that step there prevents any uh, excess buildup from getting little globs in those corners that won't dry well and won't finish up well. Once I'm done with that initial buff down, I'll take the soaked rag, kind of give the, the main surface another coat. This time just a thin coat, whatever's on that cloth, paper towel. But I'm not globbing it up in the corners or any of those holes this time. I'm just kind of adding another layer. Helps build the sheen a little faster. Then I grab a fresh paper towel and do a second final buff on this first coat of gel poly. And it's really tough to get the camera to do justice to how this finish looks and feels in person. Quite remarkable in my estimation. And I've said it before, if the gel poly kind of gets away from you where it starts getting too sticky to wipe like it is down here, you can always take that saturated cloth, wipe it back on there. You'll feel it wake that finish back up. It goes from uh, sticky to normal, pretty short order. And then you can proceed with the uh, other step of wiping. No harm done. <clears throat> and when that first coat is, is done, it should all just be perfectly smooth when I'm wiping here. I don't feel any resistance from any varnish that's built upon the surface. And it's good to go. I'll let this dry for a good 24 hours after I do the whole door, that is, and then apply a second coat just because it's a door and it's going to be in heavy use for a lot of years hanging in the shop here. Considering that Chip has been involved in this door project from the beginning, I figured it was only fitting to invite him in to come and add the gel poly to the second side of this door. As you can see, he works a lot faster than I do, so he's able to apply the first coat to the whole face of the door at the same time, going around all the edges, getting a nice, generous coat of that gel poly on there to seal the door up nice. While he's hard at it over there, I'll ask that if you like the kind of content you're seeing in this video, that you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. This is definitely an in-depth project, episode nine of the door, and there's a couple more to go before this thing is all done, and I can move on to the next project. And if you like learning from this kind of a build video, I think you'll find other videos here on the channel helpful for this kind of information. During the break I get while Chip's at work, I'll remind you that in the video description there's links to Amazon that show the products and tools that I use in this video and in other build videos here on the channel. You can get those at the same low online price you'd expect, even though Amazon pays small ad fees to Next Level Carpentry as an influencer for posting those links on these videos. If you can't find the stuff locally, those links are there for you to use so you can do projects with the results you'd expect as well. We're both wearing Teespring t-shirts for Next Level Carpentry. There's links to that. There's links to PayPal if you want to tip the teacher or tip the student. And there's also a link to Patreon if you're interested in going above and beyond to support the channel. And I'll talk more about that later towards the end of the video. But as fast as Chip is, looks like he's wrapping up his face of the door a lot quicker than I did. And it's a nice looking job, if I do say. Yo, Matt, I got this all coated here, so uh, I'm ready to throw in the towel, if that's all right with you. I think uh, it goes to prove second verse is the same as the first, and I think your door is all good to go. Sure, Chip, looks great. Appreciate all the help. Well, you're welcome. It's coming out great, and uh, thanks everybody for watching. I appreciate you hanging out here too. Well, thanks. I appreciate you saying so. I know that you were part of making the door and getting it to this stage. So thanks to you too. 
I'm going to call it a day and get back to doing a little more varnish work on this door after this first coat has had a chance to dry. After about 24 hours, I give the door a quick once over with 320 grit sandpaper to reestablish the buttery smooth finish and feel to the surface and then wipe on a generous second coat of gel poly to all the surfaces of the door. Because I've done my homework all the way along, this is a very quick streamlined process. And the end result I get is just a fantastic sheen to the door and a buttery smooth feel that you can hardly imagine if you haven't experienced it yourself. And in this handheld shot, you can almost get a glimpse of the surface of the wood that actually does it justice for the finish I get with that Old Masters gel poly. So now it's hurry up and wait again, leaving this sit in the airstream from the furnace overnight so I can put the hardware back on it and stick it back in the opening. Tempest has fugated and now the varnish is dry so I can level the door out, slip the table saw back underneath the door slab, lower the stands, remove the clamps, put the door into a good working position and then quickly reattach the door bottom and the sugatsune hinges to the slab. Like I mentioned earlier, I take a sharp scratch awl and dimple the ends of the channel to hold the vinyl door bottom in place during use. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, reinstalling the varnish door into its jam. And truthfully, I'm not sure everybody's been waiting for this moment, but I sure am. And in truth, it's not actually the moment I've been waiting for because I still need to remove this door one more time when I finish it up in a future episode after installing the cherry pellet wood strips into the faces of the door in a grand finale episode. I'm not going to lie to you, these Sugatsune hinges are amazing pieces of hardware, but it takes a lot of fiddling, fussing, and alignment to get everything in the right position to rehang the door. Thankfully, they've got high quality machined socket head cap screws to hold the hinges into the socket. And once you get everything right, all you have to do is tighten them up and you're done. Now let's check the swing and the fit of a door without the latch hardware in it so that I know I'm not kidding myself when I see a perfect fit after the latch has been installed and the latch bolt is engaged. Once I'm convinced that the door slab aligns perfectly with the jam and that it swings freely and smoothly, I can reinstall the lock set so that the door functions completely. I make a habit of starting all the machine screws by hand and only tightening them finger tight until they've all been started before tightening them up for the final hardware installation. This simple step prevents a lot of misalignment issues and eliminates the possibility of cross-threading any of these screws when installing door hardware. And you just gotta love that latching action when a heavy solid door is installed correctly. There's a little brushed stainless cap that covers this bottom handle screw, but I'm not putting that on yet because I need to take this back off for the final steps in finishing up the door later. And this demonstrates how a door should latch when everything is installed, aligned, and adjusted correctly. It takes very little effort to swing this door shut so that it latches without slamming and releases with only minimal pressure on the thumb latch. And now that I've reached the end of the beginning with the door all varnished and reinstalled, I'll give a shout out to all the patrons who support Next Level Carpentry through Patreon. Everyone on this list goes above and beyond with a pledge that helps justify the time and effort it takes to produce videos like this. To show my appreciation of that support, all these patrons have access to a growing library of behind the scenes videos like the ones mentioned at the beginning of this video. Patrons watch me rebuild the latch style of this door to add an LVL core that was necessary to correct drastic wood movement issues that developed from using unstable pallet wood. They saw me go to great pains to preserve that piece of copper wire that runs through this door because I thought that was a key element of the door and I didn't want to just make a new door style to replace the original one. There's also the in-depth Master the Joiner series I did to demonstrate and explain how to get next level performance out of the joiner. I showed techniques and methods that I use on a daily basis when building stuff like this pallet wood door. I included a link to Patreon in the video description below for any viewers who are interested in access to that library and are inclined to join this list of viewers who go above and beyond for the channel, which I really appreciate. But for now, and as always, until next time when I show how to use precision millwork methods to make 40 identical slats out of cherry pallet wood to infill the faces of this door like this. Thanks for watching. Not everyone's going to believe this, but 
I got to tell you, shooting the intro and the outro to these videos, it's a whole lot more work than building the door itself. But hey, I guess it's all part of living the dream, right? And because you choose to hang around to the end of the end of the end, I'll give you a little preview of what some of these slats look like. I've already uh, made these. I've shot the whole video. It's almost done producing. But uh, there are some kind of cool pieces in here. If I take time, I can match them up. Most of these were resawn out of the same piece, but you can kind of get an idea of some of the, uh, the beauty and the character and the grain of these pieces. There's a huge array of different types, wavy grain, uh, sapwood, knots, checks, nail holes, the whole deal. Uh, there's a couple of real highlights like these guys right here. Look at that grain. I think these were cut next to each other, but just amazing pieces. And to think that this was all pallet wood. Some pretty cool stuff. So I'm excited to show you the process for um, making these. And then ultimately, when I have to select them and arrange them, to the faces of the door for the final installation. And I think that'll be episode 10 of this video series. Never thought it would go 10 episodes in a year, but hey, there you have it. And for all you diehards that watch to the end of the end of the end, thanks again, I really appreciate it. Catch you next time.